this section I'm going to go over some useful and common Linux commands, uh, give you a bit of context. So if you're playing along at home and installing Linux for yourself as well, uh, you know what it is you're doing. And uh, before we get started, I want to speak to the Windows folks out there who are not familiar with Unix or Linux at all. I'll tell you what you're about to see is going to be a little bit foreign to you, uh, but I want to kind of assert that it's easy to understand. Just give it a little bit of time. And it's easy to understand in the same way that maybe someone who's looking over your shoulder when you're coding HTML or C Sharp or whatever says, oh my gosh, I could never understand that. What are you doing? You say, well, it's actually quite easy. Look, and you explain it to them. Maybe they'll understand it. Maybe they won't. Uh, so in the same way, we're going to be executing commands against the operating system today. Now, I could install a desktop if I wanted to, uh, but I don't really want a desktop on a server. It doesn't make much sense. So I'm going to keep things at a simple level today and work through the command line. The command line accepts common commands, and with a little bit of explanation, you start to get it. You start to understand it in the way, same way you understand code. Same way that if uh, you went into an interview and someone said in C Sharp, uh, how do you open a file and splash the text inside of a file on the console screen? You would say, hmm, let's see, I got to use system.io.file, file that open, and then I'm going to use a stream reader, blah, 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 blah. And you start executing those things in your brain. Now, someone said to me, well, how do you open up a configuration file, let's say, and uh, tweak Apache? Well, I'd say, well, let's see, it's sudo vi etc um, apache2 apache2.conf. And that's just because I've been using it. I've been using it over the past month or so. Uh, I've become familiar with it. And in the same way, all the commands that you're about to see, you'll become familiar with as well. All right, well, let's get started. And we'll take a look at the first thing you're going to need to understand, which is the file system. How is this thing put together? Well, the very core of a Unix file system is called the root. So what you're looking at here is the root inside of the root are all these separate directories inside of Linux. Now, I know that my FTP program, which is what I used to snap this picture, my FTP program shows these things as folders. But that's the first distinction. Linux doesn't have folders, it has directories. Folders are a visual sort of thing, so maybe you start thinking in terms of directories, it helps. All right, well, let's take a look at what these directories are and what they do. Uh, first is our bin directory. Same kind of bin directory you work with with ASP.NET, just binaries go in there. Things like shell and daemons and other things go inside the binary. Inside boot goes certain boot scripts, and things that require the server to boot. Dev, devices. ETC will be working with a lot today. You heard me talk about it just now. Uh, the naming of ETC, I'm not entirely sure of. There's a raging debate whether it means etc., meaning, hey, what's in that file? I don't know, configuration files, uh, etc. Yeah, maybe people just shorthanded it and said, I called it etc. No one knows what's in there. Uh, other people think it means extended tool chest. Who knows? But if you need to configure something, etc is where you configure it. If you need to restart a service, etc, init d, it's generally where you stop and start the service. Um, if you have a system like Apache 2, uh, then it'll have its own directory. VSFTPD, which is an FTP system, it'll have its own directory inside of etc. Home is where your home directory is. So for me, on my Ubuntu system, my home directory is home slash Rob. If your name is Joe, yours would be home slash Joe. Uh, so skipping down to the var folder, uh, there's lots of things in there, including log files. You should get to know the var folder. But if you're trying to debug something like Apache, you want to know, hey, where's the log file go? There is a directory inside var called log, and inside there, each system or daemon has its own log. Um, inside user or USR are all user installed programs. So moving on from the directory structure, let's talk about files really quickly. And uh, I want to say that Linux is a very open system, incredibly open. Everything in there is a text file. You can configure and change and tweak just about everything. Just open it up in a text editor like VI, which we'll talk about in a moment. It's a strange sort of system. People are a little bit put off by it. Because uh, it's easy to tweak configurations, or basically just XML. You restart a service and you're off and running. There is no weird MMC snap in, there is no binary file shoved into the bowels of the system, there's no registry in Linux. It's very, very open, and some people find that disconcerting, other people find it comforting. Uh, text files, or any file in Linux, they do not need to have extensions. It's because there's no visual tool associated with it. Generally, if you want to work with something, you just open it up inside of VI. 
So let's start with our first command. And this is the command that will help you work with the system. It's called man. And you might have heard something about man before, man pages. Um, in this case, we are asking for help with the chmod command. What does chmod do? If you don't know, type in man chmod. If you type in man chmod, uh, you will see a bunch of text spill, spill out on the screen. You'll be in reading mode, man mode. If you want to get out of it, just hit a Q and you'll escape. Uh, the next thing you're going to be using a lot of is sudo. You might have heard sudo a lot and people say, well, you need to install this as root or you need to do this operation as root. What they're saying is you have to use sudo. If you ever see access permissions or you can't change permissions, you can't add this file, you can't create a directory, whatever, it's because you need to elevate yourself. That's what sudo does. Uh, you have to enter your password when you do that. And the same kind of thing, you can see it in Vista. Vista has the same sort of system when you need to elevate to do a certain thing. It tells you need to run this as an administrator. And sometimes it makes you enter your password and so on. Chmod is, well, it's what we've been talking about. It stands for change mode. What it does is simply change the permissions on a directory or a file. You'll be using this a lot, especially when it comes to um, installing and uh, configuring a website. If you're using a scripting site like uh, PHP or Ruby, and you're going to pop it on the system, uh, a lot of times it won't have execute rights or won't have write abilities uh, for a given directory. PHP requires that for uh, one of its directories, I believe it's WP content or WP uploads. You have to chmod the WP uploads directory uh, to allow the public to write to it. And you do that with a certain code. I'll explain what that is in just a second. LS stands for list files and directories. Uh, useful if you do ls-a, it just shows what's in there. ls-l for long shows extended information. So let's talk about file access for a second. Um, and when you do ls-l in a given file, as we've done here in the first line, what you get back is a bunch of gobbledygook. And that is what's noted as symbolic notation. I'm just talking about the first dash rw dash r blah, 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 blah. That is symbolic notation for the uh, information on the file. The very first character tells you what that file is. As I mentioned before, uh, files do not have to have extensions. So you, sometimes it's hard to know, am I looking at a directory or a file, or is this a symbolic link, which is the same as an uh, alias. Um, and so that's what that first character tells you. If you see a dash, that's a file. D, directory, L is a link. Uh, the next things are a little bit more strange. Uh, but what you want to do with those is you want to divide those into groups of three. So starting with the RW there, RW dash is the first group, then R dash dash, R dash dash. Those are grouped, and they're grouped into meanings. So the first three are a user. What rights does a user have on this file or directory? What rights does the group have? And what does everybody else or the public have? In this case, if you see an RW, it's read write. The dash means nothing. Uh, if we could execute, it would be RWX. Uh, the group can only read R dash dash. Uh, if we could only execute it, it'd be dash dash x. So that's how that works. Uh, so if you want to see the full notation breakdown, uh, no permission, all dashes, execute, there's x's, but it usually goes in the same pattern, r, w, x. So believe it or not, this is one of those situations where when you first look at it, you say, oh my gosh, do I really need to understand this? It looks a little bit crunchy to me. It's one of those things where as you start doing it more and more and more and more, it just kind of bakes into your brain same way as some wacky lambda syntax might bake into your brain after doing it a couple times. So let's talk about the next notation. Now you saw the command I put in before, which was sudo chmod 777 home public blah, 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 blah. What I was doing there is I was changing the access rights on that file. And instead of using, which I could have used, I could have used R's and W's and so on. Instead of doing that, I used octal notation, which is a little bit easier on the fingers. It's an easier for people to understand. And the way that this works is it's a simple additive. There's the same uh, grouping here. The first letter is for user, second letter, or excuse me, first number is for user, second number is for group, third number is for public or everybody else. And it's just simply additive. If you have no rights, well, it's just a zero. Uh, if you have uh, read, well, then it's a four. If you have read and write, well, that's just added together. That's a six. If you have full rights, it's a four plus two plus one, which is a seven. So this command right here gives everybody read, write, and execute. User, group, and public. So the next command is everyone's favorite, grep. And grep is a simple search using regular expressions over a system. So the first command you have here is grep. 
and I'm looking for the term happiness in all of the log files in my current directory. Uh, the next command there, I'm using the dash I option, which means case insensitive. And I'm looking for words that start with HAPP. I'm looking in the log file. So this is a full-blown regular expression. There's lots of tricks to grep. It's one of the most powerful features of Unix. Uh, a lot of people love it. In fact, someone I think the other day called it voodoo black magic in an awesome way. CD is one you're going to see me use a lot. It's change directory. So if I want to change what directory I'm currently working in, well, that's the command, etc apache2. You're going to see me do that today. Uh, that's where all the configuration is. If you want to know more about it, of course, man cd. PWD is a way of saying, hey, where am I? Present working directory. Now, a lot of people say, it looks like password. That's not really. It's just present working directory. It's one of those things where you can kind of wind your way around doing lots of CD work, and then bam, where am I? What, what directory am I in? I forgot. CP and MV, copy and move. It's a simple syntax. You copy a directory from, copy to. Or you can copy a file, of course, from, to, and so on. If you hit dash R, that's recursive. What that means is if you copy a directory that has files in it, using CP, and you try and copy it to another directory, uh, what will happen if there's files inside of the copy, or inside of the directory you're trying to copy from, you'll get a warning. Can't move this, there's files inside of here. You can say, well, that's okay, move them anyway, dash R. That's recursive. If you are moving uh, files from one directory to another, and there's the same name files in the other directory, you can hit dash I and say, prompt me before you overwrite these, please. That just means interactive. MKDIR and RMDIR, those are two more that you'll be using a lot of, just makes directories and removes directories. Uh, removing a directory works the same way uh, as copying. If there's files inside of it, it won't do it. You won't delete a directory with files inside thinking, well, are you sure you know? You don't really know. You gotta tell me explicitly. That's when you use rm-r, and that will remove everything recursively inside of a directory. Tar is one that a lot of people like to use. This is the zipping and archiving ability. Tar stands for tape archive, and usually when you pull stuff off the web, you'll pull it down in what's known as a tar ball, tar.gz. And a lot of people wonder what that means. And uh, it just means tar, tape archive, just means this is an archive file. GZ means it's been gzipped. And to work with that, you simply use the tar command and you pass in some options. So to create a file, you enter in a dash C, it means create the archive. V means verbose, it's an option, you don't need to use it, but it just shows you what files are being crunched up. It's kind of a way of seeing the progress roll by. So in this example, uh, archive.tar.gz is the file name, and it's one of the rare times in Linux where uh, you have to specify options in a given order. Usually you can specify the options however you like. But in this case, F means here comes a file name, so you have to specify it right, uh, the file name right after the F. Now, if you want to unzip something, it's a dash X, which means extract, V, verbose, show me what's happening, F, here comes the file name. Cat is another good one. It takes the text of a file and displays it to the console. I'll show you that in just a second, but if we do cat etc password, it's going to show me all the users of my system. So speaking of users, here's some typical user administration commands. I want to add a user to my system, user add, and then change it, user mod, and user del. Uh, and then you just, the only thing that's required in here is the name. Now if you do a user mod, of course, you want to uh, pop in the name with a given option. So if you want to change the group, it's a dash G, change the password, dash P, and so on. Uh, there's not really much else to this. Uh, you might want to do a man on each one of these commands if you're going to be doing any user administration to find out more information. Now, if you do want to find out users in your system, you can just take a look at the etc password file. Uh, inside here is all the users that are on the system and basically their information minus their password. In the old days, they used to keep the password in here, but now they've kind of secured and tightened things up a little bit. Uh, they keep it in the etc shadow file where it's MD5 hashed. So on my system here locally, I just did a cat etc password and out pops all the users on my system. And one of the neat things here is that uh, the last notation there, the colon separates uh, each option or each value. The very last element there is uh, the bash file, or excuse me, the shell file that uh, each user will use. So uh, root, the default, is using the bash, the born again shell. It is a default shell, but you can change it. If you don't like your bash, you can go in, you can use your mod and change your shell to use something like ZSH, which a lot of people like to use. Okay, so let's move on to uh, editing and tweaking text with VI. And at this point, I should tell you, VI is not your only option. You can install a bunch of different text editors. Uh, a lot of people really love Emacs. Uh, I'm not an Emacs person. Some people are. Uh, Pico is another one. 
Uh, everybody's got their favorite one. VI I just find super easy. And what I'm going to show you is enough to edit configuration files. Now, I'm not going to show you too much here because, well, I don't usually use VI too, uh, too often. Um, don't really do much editing in it, although today I will be creating an HTML page uh, with it, so uh, you'll see me do some fiddling. Um, but in VI, uh, there's one tricky thing that you're going to need to know. If you're going to be editing a configuration file, which is the primary use of VI, at least for a, a Unix system or a server, uh, you want to make sure you use sudo. You want to elevate. Uh, in this command right here, this is one I talked about in the very beginning, how you edit the configuration file. Now you got to make sure you have sudo in. If you don't add sudo in, v, uh, VI will open the configuration file for you. It'll allow you to change stuff inside there, but when it comes to saving, it'll say, sorry, can't do it. You need to be root. And so you want to make sure you enter that uh, if you're going to be changing stuff. So there's two modes in VI, because uh, it is a console editor. You know, there is no save buttons. There's no tricky, groovy backgrounds. It's just text on a page. And so there is command mode. And when you when you first enter VI, you enter in command mode, and you can do certain things in there. You can delete lines, you can move around the page, and so on. And when you get to the page or the element that you want to be at, that's when you change to insert or append mode, which is the next. You just hit an I, and then you'll see a visual cue down below. It'll say insert, and then you can start typing. You're going to see me do this today. Uh, when you're done and you're ready to uh, go back into command mode to save, just hit escape. And then you can enter the command you want to uh, work. So if you want to save and quit, you enter in an X. If you want to just quit without saving your changes, just put in a Q. And if you want to quit and ignore all changes, if you made any change, you want to ignore it, you got to hit an exclamation mark. Well, that's a quick overrun of VI. And you're going to see me do all these things. Uh, you might want to refer to the notes down below for all the codes and everything I showed you. Um, and I want to ask you, are you confused? Does everything you see here look kind of crunchy and wacky and kooky? Well, don't feel too distressed. Uh, I'm going to go over it a lot, and I will urge you once again to keep an open mind. Uh, because if you do have to set up a Rails box in the Linux system, it just takes a little bit of Googling, a little bit of man help, man pages, and, uh, and you'll be on your way. You do a couple things, and you'll be zipping around the directories before you even know it. Oh, yeah, i got to edit this thing. You'll learn to use your shell and everything will be just fine. So that said, let's get to working with the stuff on Linux.